let's talk about pulmonary embolism. You have been called to admit a patient with a pulmonary embolism to the medical ICU. The patient is a 55-year-old man with prostate cancer who presented after a syncopal episode at home. His vitals are notable for a heart rate of 115, blood pressure of 100 over 60, baseline 120 over 70, and oxygen saturation 84% on ambient air, requiring 4 liters per minute nasal cannula. He was found to have a large saddle PE on imaging. Labs, ECG, and echocardiogram have been obtained as well. How would you classify this patient's PE? What treatment should he receive? In this video, we will review PE nomenclature, identify clinical manifestations of right ventricular dysfunction, and identify patients with acute PE that benefit from thrombolysis. First, let's start with PE nomenclature. Acute pulmonary embolism exists on a spectrum. On one end is low risk, and on the other end is high risk, hemodynamically unstable, or massive PE. All terms can be used interchangeably. For the purposes of this video, we will use the term massive PE. Massive PE is defined as PE causing cardiac arrest, shock, persistent hypotension with a systolic blood pressure less than 90 for longer than 15 minutes, or systolic blood pressure drop of greater than 40 from baseline despite adequate fluid resuscitation. Low risk PE is defined as a hemodynamically stable PE with normal biomarkers and no evidence of RV dysfunction. Between low risk and massive lies intermediate risk or submassive PE. Submassive PE is defined as acute PE associated with evidence of RV dysfunction. We evaluate for RV dysfunction by assessing for positive biomarkers, ECG changes, or imaging evidence of RV dysfunction. The relevant biomarkers include troponin and BNP or NT pro BNP. An elevated troponin indicates myocardial necrosis. An elevated BNP indicates RV stretch and dysfunction. Next, we assess the ECG for changes associated with RV dysfunction. Shown is the patient's ECG. Take 10 seconds to identify as many signs as possible of RV dysfunction. The RV is an anterior and inferior structure. Therefore, it is best assessed with the precordial leads V1 through V4 and inferior leads 2, 3, and AVF. We will be looking in these locations for evidence of RV dysfunction. First, there is right axis deviation as demonstrated by a negative QRS in lead 1 and positive QRS in 2, 3, and AVF. Next, there is an RSR prime pattern in V1 indicating right bundle branch block. In addition, a dominant R wave in V1, meaning greater than 7 mm tall, or an R to S ratio greater than 1, indicates RV dilation or hypertrophy. Next, there is the classic RV strain pattern of T wave inversions in V1 through V4 and 2, 3, and AVF. Finally, there is an S1, Q3, T3 pattern, classically associated with PE, though the sign is neither sensitive nor specific. Next, let's discuss imaging evidence of RV dysfunction, specifically CTPE and transthoracic echocardiogram. CT evidence of RV dysfunction includes an RV to LV ratio of greater than 0.9 and flattening or bowing of the interventricular septum. In addition, reflux of contrast into the IVC and hepatic vein may indicate RV dysfunction. On transthoracic echocardiogram, RV dilation may be apparent on the parasternal long axis view, but is best assessed on the parasternal short axis and apical forechamber views. Let's review our patient's TTE. On the parasternal short axis view, RV dilation and septal bowing into the LV create the D sign, evidence of RV volume or pressure overload. On the apical forechamber view, an RV that is larger than the LV and septal bowing again indicate RV volume or pressure overload. Finally, McConnell sign is specific for PE. 
McConnell sign is defined as RV free wall akinesis with apical sparing. What does that actually look like on the apical four chamber or isolated RV view? Essentially, McConnell sign appears as an apical bounce or isolated contraction when compared to the RV free wall. Next, let's discuss PE treatment principles, specifically, which patients with acute PE benefit from thrombolysis. Thrombolytic therapy, also known as lytic therapy or TPA, is standard of care for massive PE, as long as there is no contraindication. From a meta-analysis from 2004, thrombolysis was associated with a reduction in recurrent pulmonary embolism or death in trials that included patients with hemodynamically unstable PE, 9.4% versus 19%. All to place is administered within our hospital system. For patients with massive PE that are not in cardiac arrest, all to place 100 mg IV is administered over 2 hours. For patients in cardiac arrest, the dose is administered over 2 minutes during the code. Of note, in code situations, CPR must be continued for at least 20 to 30 minutes following all to place administration to allow for circulation of the medication and clot breakdown. Both doses should be followed by therapeutic anticoagulation with unfractionated heparin, if possible. All patients with submassive PE should receive therapeutic anticoagulation with either unfractionated heparin or low molecular weight heparin. However, the decision to administer thrombolytics is less straightforward. The PITHO trial in 2014 randomized 1,006 patients with submassive PE to tenecteplase, a thrombolytic, plus heparin or placebo plus heparin. The tenecteplase group had a lower rate of death or hemodynamic decline compared to placebo, 2.6% versus 5.6%. But this difference was driven almost entirely by reduced rates of hemodynamic decline in the tenecteplase group. In addition, the tenecteplase group had a higher rate of extracranial bleeding and stroke. A three-year follow-up of 709 patients from the PITHO trial found no significant difference in mortality, clinical symptoms, or echocardiographic evidence of pH and or RV dysfunction between the tenecteplase and placebo groups. Overall, the PITHO trial and subsequent follow-up provide evidence for thrombolysis only in patients with submassive PE who have failed initial anticoagulation and exhibit signs of hemodynamic decompensation or clinical decline, for example, worsening hypotension or hypoxia and or new onset shock after starting anticoagulation. Another possible treatment option is catheter-directed thrombolysis. Small trials have shown that catheter-directed therapy, where thrombolytics are delivered directly to the pulmonary arteries via a catheter, decreased RV to LV ratio, increased RV function at 24 hours, and decreased risk of bleeding. Trials thus far have shown no mortality benefit. To determine whether a patient with submassive PE is a good candidate for systemic thrombolysis or catheter-directed thrombolysis, the PE response team, or PERT, can be consulted if available. The PERT is composed of pulmonary and critical care, interventional radiology, cardiothoracic surgery, and pharmacy, and provides expert multidisciplinary decision-making for patients with acute PE. To recap, thrombolysis is standard of care for massive PE, and should be considered for patients with submassive PE who have failed initial anticoagulation and are exhibiting signs of hemodynamic decompensation. Let's return to our 55-year-old patient with a saddle PE. He has evidence of RV dysfunction on labs, ECG, and imaging, but is currently hemodynamically stable. Therefore, we can classify his PE as submassive. An appropriate treatment strategy would be to start the patient on an unfractionated heparin drip for anticoagulation and admit to the medical ICU for close monitoring to ensure he does not experience further hemodynamic decompensation. If this were to occur, alteplase could be administered to hopefully avert further decline. In this video, we reviewed PE nomenclature, including the definitions for massive and submassive PE. Next, we identified clinical manifestations of right ventricular dysfunction, including positive biomarkers, ECG changes, and relevant CT and TTE findings. Finally, we identified which patients with acute PE benefit from thrombolysis, patients with massive PE, and select patients with submassive PE exhibiting signs of clinical decline. Thank you for watching.